Uh, well, like I was saying, brothers, it is great to be together with you this evening as we continue our spiritual enrichment class on the Holy Spirit. You know, a couple weeks ago, Kevin did a lesson on walking in step with the Spirit and, and what that looks like for us to do that. So tonight, we're going to continue on with our series. And uh, as Jimmy said, my lesson is going to be on the fruit of the Spirit. And so if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. I do not have any slides. You're going to have to follow along with me in your Bibles or on your apps, and you're going to have to take notes, which I am going to strongly encourage you to do, because I'm going to be throwing some scriptures at you tonight. Uh, but it is just an incredible privilege and encouragement to me to be able to uh, bring God's word to such esteemed uh, and incredible brothers as yourselves. And so uh, I hope that tonight I can share just some insights that I've gotten from digging into the text, uh, as well as just some, some things that have really convicted me, and I hope convict you as well. And so, you know, in Galatians chapter 5, in verses 13 through 26, kind of the bigger chunk of the passage, right, Paul is talking about life by the Spirit, and he covers in just 13 verses so many different aspects of our spiritual life, right? These 13 verses contain one of the most often used sinless uh, verses 19 through 21 that many of us are familiar with, have memorized, have used countless times in Bible studies. Uh, but he talks about living by the Spirit and, and not living by the flesh. It's a huge emphasis here. But where we're going to pick up is in verse 22. I don't know about you guys. I use 19 through 21 all the time and very rarely use 22 through 23. I find my wife uses it a lot more often with the women. Uh, in studies like that, where she's trying to be more inspirational. But I don't use it all that often, to my shame, I say that. And so, you know, this was very helpful for me even, kind of reacquaint myself and get back in here. But in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things... There is no law. You know, as I said, Paul talks about a lot in this passage. The theme is really this, this battle of spirit versus flesh, as we talked about. But, you know, in verse 19, in, in that passage, he talks about the acts of the, of the sinful nature are obvious, or the acts of the flesh are obvious, right? And he uses this kind of language. But in verse 22, he uses very different language. He says, the fruit of the spirit. And I know with the title and everything, we've heard that a lot. Okay, fruit, fruit, fruit. Uh, but as, as I thought about this and I kind of dug into it, it's very different when you compare the acts of the nature, right? In the way that, okay, the acts of, the results of, kind of the driving things that come as a part of your participation in the sinful nature versus, okay, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of walking in step with the Holy Spirit. And it reminded me when I thought of fruit, I thought of, man, there are a lot of parables where Jesus talked about trees and fruit. And so if you'll turn with me to Matt, I'm going to go through a couple of these, but it, notably, if you want to just write them down, Matthew 7, verse 17 through 20, Jesus said, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them, right? It's this passage that in context is Jesus talking to the disciples about how to identify false prophets, but he used this analogy of, of fruit and trees. And then again, in Matthew 12, 33 through 35, he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And again, the context of the passage is, Jesus' response to being compared to Beelzebub, right? And, oh, it's by the power of demons that he casts out demons. And he goes back and he says, no, no, that's not the case. You, you will recognize 
by its fruit, whether someone is a good tree or a bad tree. And ultimately, the punchline of both of these parables is that the fruit shows the greater condition of the tree, right? The fruit will tell you if the tree is good or the tree is bad. The fruit will tell you if someone is a false prophet. The fruit will tell you if someone is working for God or working against God. The fruit is just produced naturally as a result of what is going on with the tree. And so it is with the fruit of the spirit, right? Fruit isn't something that's worked for. If you're imagining a, a fruit bearing tree, right? We went apple picking with the Ohana group, like the very first Saturday we moved in, which was so much fun. And uh, so I got a close up of some fruit trees. I hadn't had that in a while. But if you think about a fruit tree, right? Does it exert more effort to have better fruit? And, it, and if, it, you know, you go to an apple tree and the apples taste terrible, that's just a, a lazy tree. You know, that year it just, it didn't do anything great. No, a tree produces fruit naturally as a result of its overall health and condition. In order to have great fruit, a tree needs to be well watered. The ground where it's rooted needs to be nourishing. And the light shining on it needs to be radiant. It needs to be bright. Not too hot, but perfect. And the reality is, is that when you are living a life in step with the Holy Spirit, when you're being rooted and nourished by God's word, and when you are living in unity with God's people, the Holy Spirit changes you. And it produces these qualities of Jesus in your life as it transforms you to be more like Jesus. Or we see this in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, right? Paul talking to the church in Corinth about, and we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. But what's critical in this equation is, okay, what's the condition, the spiritual condition of the tree? Of all the things we just said, again, the fruit will come naturally, but where's the tree at? Because if you plant a tree in the desert where there's no water, where there's not good soil, where it's not being taken care of, the tree, of course, isn't going to produce good fruit. You'll be lucky if that tree produces anything. It's simply just out there trying to survive. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves, right, as we examine the fruit of the Spirit, I don't know about you guys, but I look at the fruit of the Spirit and I, I see things that I go, man, I, I'm very good at this one. Like I can say humbly, you know, I'm very good at being patient. Or I can look at this and say, well, I'm I feel like I'm generally a very kind person. And I look at those other ones and my spirit can be, well, I just need to train myself to be, you know, more gentle, or I need to train myself to be more of this, like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really go after growing in this quality, but I don't go back and go, well, well, what's the condition of my tree that it's not producing this fruit? And that's the question all of us need to ask ourselves tonight. How is my tree? Am I feeding it with the word of God consistently? Am I devoted in that? Am I watering it with decisions made in righteousness and holiness? Is my tree engaged and connected and unified with the body of Christ? Because again, when you are living in step with the spirit, you're fulfilling God's vision here. And we see this in John 15 in verse five, right? Jesus talking to the disciples and, and it's, he's given them kind of these visions and, and praying for all the, you know, praying for his disciples, praying for the future believers, praying for the world. He's, he's doing all these things. But in John 15, we get this great insight in verse five. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. It's a promise of God. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This 
is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, God's dream is for us to be fruitful, to bear fruit Not by helping people come to have this incredible relationship with Jesus. Absolutely. But also, he says, to bear much fruit that you would become more like Jesus, like Paul told the church in Corinth that, that a, an ever increasing glory, an ever increasing transformation into the character of Jesus is a part of the fruit of remaining in the vine, of living this life. And unfortunately, you know, with COVID, with a pandemic, I mean, this was a traumatic thing these last year and a half to two years for us. And some of us during this time, have become trees in the desert where we've been living in places where the soil hasn't been good, hasn't been consistently nourished, where we've been living in places where, man, maybe the watering was good in the beginning, but it's, it's drifted off and become irregular and infrequent, where maybe the decisions that we're making haven't been based in righteousness, where we haven't been real and honest and unified with our brothers. And the thing is, the Bible says it shows. Like by a tree's fruit, you can tell the condition. You know, for some of us, the condition can be seen, whether it's consistently coming late to church, whether that means, you know, you're willfully disconnecting yourself from the fellowship, not because of your health concern, but, but because of, I don't really need people. Maybe your heart has gotten to that place. You know, and another one, and I'm just, I'm going to say this, I hope you guys can, can appreciate and kind of go with me here. But another one is just not staying for the D groups after midweek. I was surprised, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago when we had, uh, when Kevin did the spiritual enrichment class, I ended up in a D group that I thought, oh man, I'm going to have four or five people here. And I ended up in a D group with Paul Orlowski, which was amazing. I got to spend some time with Paul. I got to know him. Paul's incredible, but it was just us two. And I asked Evan, I said, Evan, what, you know, why was my D group? I thought maybe, you know, and this was, I'm sorry, Evan, you know, I should have, I should have given you the benefit of the doubt. I assumed there was some kind of technical difficulty and, you know, and so I apologize, bro. That, that's on me. But I came to Evan. I said, Evan, what happened to my D group? There was only two people in my, in my room. Like I wanted some more brothers to connect to. And he said, man, do you know what, bro? To be honest with you, as soon as Jimmy announced the D group, probably 40 or 50 people, you know, dropped off the call. He said, there's a window in there where you can drop off as everyone's going to D groups and it doesn't alert anyone that you're gone. I said, wow. You know, that's, that's fruit of some kind. And that's an indicator for some of us of maybe where our heart condition is. Maybe where COVID has allowed our heart condition to get to. And that's not God's dream. That's not where we want to be. That's not where God wants us to be. God's dream is for us to be connected, to be fruitful in our relationships with each other as much as outward, outwardly focused and in the world. You know, the only one who wants us to become a dead, desert, disconnected tree is Satan. He's the only one who enjoys seeing us out in a parched land, not bearing fruit. And, you know, it can be tough in those times. I remember as a campus student, I got baptized. I don't know how many of you I've told my story, but I got baptized my freshman year of college, was fired up, uh, a lot of zeal, very little knowledge. And, you know, I, I very gratefully became a disciple, but did not have really deep conviction and struggled for probably the first three years of my discipleship with really making Jesus Lord on a daily consistent basis. My campus minister had a weak and concerned list 
people, you know, that, that when they would have leaders meetings, you know, hey, this brother, you know, something, you know, he had a death in the family, like, let's make sure that we give him extra encouragement, or, you know, this brother over here, he's been really struggling, you know, let's make sure that we're praying extra, that we're, we're pulling him in, we're loving up, you know, they had kind of this, this list, I was perennially on this list for like three years, because I would go through these phases of doing really well, followed by doing really poorly, and all the decisions were unspiritual decisions because I wanted to do what I wanted to do and in a lot of circumstances other brothers might have said man all right we need to we need to cut this guy loose in other ministries in other circumstances when you have someone who's who's been on the fence for that long it can be easy to go man we need to have a come in Jesus come to Jesus talk with this guy and if he's not on board he just needs to go but I had brothers in my life when I was in that parched desert who never stopped reaching out. I had brothers in my life who never stopped having a vision that I wasn't always going to be there. That that's not only is that not where God wanted me to be, that's not where they wanted me to be. And that's not where they were going to stand by idly and allow me to be. And they consistently reached out to me. They consistently called and inserted themselves annoyingly so at times into my life, but never lost the hope, man, this guy can make it. And it's because of those brothers that, that I'm even still faithful. You know, it, it, it got to a point where I had to make a decision. And was I going to turn myself in or not? Was I going to reach back out? and reciprocate what these brothers were trying to help me with. And I, I ultimately had to, I had to make a decision. Okay. I've got to turn myself in, but I was beat up because when you've been in the desert and you've been a dry parched tree, it's hard to believe that you can be fruitful again. It's hard to believe that God still wants to use you, that God still has a great vision for you to be fruitful, for this idea that the best days are still ahead of you, not behind you. You know, here I was three years old as a Christian, and I was looking at my first three months and going, those were my best days. It's, you know, I, that was it. That, those were the golden three months. And now, you know, look at me. It was hard to really listen to the voice of God, to go back to the scriptures and believe it. And I'm grateful and lucky and fortunate that I had brothers who were so long-suffering and so faithful with me that they continue to hold that vision out for me to grab onto. And we've got to be that way with each other. You know, if you're a dry, parched desert tree tonight, you've got to turn, you got to make a decision to turn yourself in. You know, again, the fruit, it, Jesus says that the fruit makes it obvious. And so if you, if you know you're a dry desert tree, chances are that the brothers that are in your life also know that you're a dry desert tree. That there's, you may think you're doing a great job of fooling them, but the spirit has other plans. Again, God is not willing to let us be in that place to live out there. And he will make those things clear to the people that care about us. And he will push them and move them to be in our life. We've got to make decisions to turn ourselves in. And the same goes for all the rest of us. We've got to make decisions to be long-suffering with one another, to persevere with one another, to have a greater vision for each other that God's not done. And God still wants to do great things. We've got to ask ourselves, what, what is the disease that has me out there? The disease of my tree? Is it selfishness that I need to overcome? You know, is it secret sin? Maybe that's been dogging me for, for the last year and a half, last couple months. Something that, man, maybe you had overcome, but has come back. And there's a level of ashamed, like, I shouldn't be wrestling with this. That we've got to just humble ourselves and turn ourselves in. Maybe it's 
patterns in your character that you've given up on, that you've said, it's just always going to be this way. I've tried to change. It's not going to change. You know, we've got to believe God's vision that we can become healthy trees again, that we can bear the fruit of the spirit because the condition of our tree is only getting better and better and better. You know, as Jimmy talked about, we've, there's a world out there, a lost world that needs us to be reaching out to them. A lost world that needs men who are going to stand up for God and go and make a difference. And the way those men are going to know whether we're false prophets or not is going to be whether they see the fruit produced in our lives and whether it's different from those around us. And so, brothers, I want to challenge us. I want to inspire us that God's dream for what the fruit of the Spirit can, can bear and do in our lives is so much greater than we can hope or imagine. That these things will come when our trees are healthy, when they're firm, when they're rooted, watered, tended to, and when they're standing strong. And so as we break out into our D groups here in just a minute, the questions that I want us to ask ourselves and, and kind of answer in our groups is, am I a healthy tree that's bearing fruit? Yes or no? And if yes, why? Why, is your, why are you bearing fruit? Like what is, what is the fruit that's being produced by your tree? And why is that? What are you doing? You know, share some of the things that are helping you in your spiritual life that are helping your tree. And if not, if the answer is no, I've been in a desert place, what needs to change? in order for your tree to become healthy again, that we might bear much fruit. Amen? Amen. And that is the lesson for tonight.